Bienvenidos a todos, este, otro bonsai al día. Hoy tenemos a Michael Hanron desde Estados Unidos para platicarnos sobre sus experiencias, sobre su, su vida y sobre la parte de bonsai. Él es uno de los grandes maestros este, y ha, estudió en Japón y estudió cerámica, como ya platicamos recientemente. Eh, la plática va a ser en inglés y va a estar traducida. So, hello, Michael. Hello, Enrique, my friend. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm glad to, to finally actually manage to, to get a hold of you. You know, it's not always easy. I know, I know, I know all the technical things. We don't always have good Wi-Fi where, where we're actually doing some work. I know I have yes. that problem at, at times. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we're usually using scissors out here rather than computers. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. It's, it's much more fun, right? Yes, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk to everybody. Thanks, 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 thanks. Well, before we start into bonsai, as I, as I mentioned already, one of the key questions that many people had after we looked at several potters from different parts of the world was your pots. You actually had very good technique on, on pottery, very nice glazes. Uh, how, did you, how did you start it? Why did you end it? And people want to know whether you're actually going to do them again. That's a great, uh, great set of questions. I, I started ceramics uh, through sculpture, actually. Um, I found it to be one of the easier things to work with. So I actually ended up going through graduate school for a ceramic sculpture. And a number of my colleagues were potters. And around that time, I started to make uh, containers for bonsai. And when I got out of graduate school, I didn't want to teach uh, sculpture. I wanted to create something and sell it. And I, and I, I thought my interest in bonsai was a good marriage with, with that. So for almost 10 years, I was a potter. But what I found was, uh, to answer the other part of your question, um, that I could be making, uh, making pots in my studio uh, all day and realize at the end of the day that I'd been thinking about trees all day. I wasn't, I wasn't even focused <laughs> on, on the pots. And so, I mean, it was sort of like a marriage that wasn't very good, you know, it was maybe like a good friend, but it wasn't more than that. It was, it was sort of a pleasant life, but I wasn't engaged with my work. I wasn't engaged with my career. So I felt like I needed to have a change. And around that time, I started studying with Boone in California and he had studied in Japan. So I got kind of a, a, a preparation for what being an apprentice would like. And around that time, I started to think maybe I would want to study in Japan. Um, And after I came back from my apprenticeship, after several years, um, I kind of thought I'd be doing both pots and, and bonsai, but uh, so many people seemed to want to know what I had learned that it ended up becoming a full-time thing, and I never went back to pots. Um, so it's, it's mostly time, but it's also just passion, I guess. I, I feel uh, uh, much more in love with sharing bonsai than I ever felt about sharing pots, about teaching. Yes, I think the teaching is part of a, a really important part in bonsai. Bonsai artists should be more focused also into trying to provide some of these experiences, right? Yeah, 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 I think you're right, yeah. It, it was also, I, I had an interest in bonsai going back to when I was a teenager. Uh, so I, I already had a little bit of information about what bonsai was and that helped, that helped with making the pots. Uh, but it, there was still a disconnect <laughs> for me, so I, I don't make pots anymore. That's fine. That's fine. Well, <laughs> we'll miss them. It will become a, it, it. It had already become a collected item, so uh, okay. I have to trade now. I have to trade with some people from Puerto Rico, some of other pots for your pots, so I can have one in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> But going back to the apprenticeship, you you actually you wrote one very interesting book after that, right? Oh, yes, I wrote a memoir about my apprenticeship. Uh, it's called uh, Post Dated, The Schooling of an Irreverent Bonsai Monk, which is a joke. Uh, we weren't monks. <laughs> But um, uh, that book um, is, uh, there's a lot of crazy stories in there. <laughs> um, when I think about it now, I can't believe the life I was leading. But, uh, you know, such books or such experiences make for good books. Um, this has just been translated into Spanish, actually. I'm hoping within the year we're going to get it out. It'll probably be an ebook. 
Um, but uh, uh, I had a, a great friend of mine, Felipe Dunn, in, in Mexico, help me translate it. And I'm very excited uh, to finally get that out. So you can That's read good. about it. That's good. That's good. If it is an ebook, actually, we can promote it. We have a web page for all the Latin American uh, oh, really? clubs. Oh, okay. so, so we can promote it there as well. Great. Thank you. We'll be in touch. <laughs> that would be, yes, that would be really good, especially because we, there's a lot of people that are always very interested about all these, these either hellish stories, because sometimes, you know, it can be like, like you, you, you survived that. Yeah. <laughs> and, Obviously, well, yeah. obviously have, the, the impressions of the different culture, right? Yes, yeah, it was, uh, it definitely was. I had, uh, I had culture shock coming back, not going there. <laughs> I really kind of like Japanese culture, but it, it, it was a shock to come back to the US. That took me a long time to, to get over. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I, under, I understand that very well. Coming, coming to Mexico after studying abroad and, and working in, in the US and working in UK, when I came back to Mexico, you know, it, it, it is a shock because the culture is completely different. The way people think it's, it's not efficient, it's not proper. So it, it, is, it is difficult sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny, as a, as a foreigner, it's difficult in a foreign country, but some things are simplified as well. A lot of the complexity, you know, you're, you're forgiven <laughs> to some degree. And so it's a different, it's a different animal. Yeah, um, it was funny, it, the study over there, to talk about bonsai education, the, the study that happens there is, is not really, it's not a, like a lecture format, it's more of a, you know, you fail at something and then you're corrected. And a lot of the corrections are done sort of non-verbally. It's like, no, not this way, this way. Or, <laughs> and, uh, and in many ways, because of the way that we learned there, I was able to learn at the same pace as uh, my senpai who was Japanese and had fluency. So that was interesting, that was interesting. It was different than being in a lecture hall in a, in a high school or a university or something like that. Yeah, 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 I can imagine. Also, you, you have many teachers because all the trees there actually do teach a lot, right? Once we begin to reading out what the trees are actually telling us, that's that, that, that they become kind of the teachers, right? Oh, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, the trees there have so much history and the branches and the design has changed multiple times. And, and uh, you know, with more exposure, we get, we get very familiar with, with seeing where people are making decisions and in some cases where the tree made a decision. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. They become kind of our teachers. And so that Japan is this incredible library of bonsai because they're so many, they're so old, they've been worked on for so long that uh, we, we don't really have that much in the West. We have, uh, we have bonsai that are fresh off the presses. <laughs> they haven't been touched by many hands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah actually that's the, same, that's the same here in Latin America. I mean, we are sort of new, the new kids in the block kind of thing. Uh, so we're starting slow. We started slow in Latin America. And now the last few years, because a lot of people began doing collecting, getting some Yamadoris, getting some pieces. And some of the information is out there for people to see. So there's a little, little improvement in, in, in our area. Um, but still, we don't have this over and over, you know, several generations of people actually doing work with the trees. Ah. So that's that's something that that is missing in, in our region, and that's something that people can learn. But they can only learn that once they are actually able to read what the trees are telling, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and then the bones of the tree, you know. Uh, and sometimes we can change that, but usually not. Usually that's a selection process. You know, we, we, we try to find a, what the Japanese call the hone, or the, the skeleton, the bone of, of the tree, the parts that we either don't want to or cannot change. Um, that then we, we drape the clothing <laughs> over this, this skeleton, and that's the design. That's how we're, we're placing the branches. Uh, and the inclination of the tree, the pot choice, all those sorts of things. Those are, those are the clothes. Um, so I think particularly 
uh, you know, we went through this this as well uh, in the U.S. and and many individual artists. I did this, but you know, 35, 40 years ago when I was a teenager, uh, it is uh, it is choosing things that don't have an awful lot of future for for bonsai. You know, the, the tree is old enough that you can't change the the bone of the tree very easily, and that it has a limited future. Whereas if you choose a very young plant, it has infinite possibilities. <laughs> or over time, we learn to recognize the bone of a tree that has a very good future. And that's when I think our whole community begins to grow because then we're building on something that has a, a wonderful future that other artists are going to be able to recognize and see and appreciate. Yes, I think, I mean, it is important, actually, the art of Misho, you know, of, of planting and starting from the beginning, that gives you the the most control over the growth of the tree. And it allows you also another thing that people for sometimes forget, the varieties, the different types of, of, of plants that we may have from one species, the diversity actually has to come from seed. So, so yeah. getting like maples, like ma Japanese maples, there's so many different uh, variations on leaf size, leaf color and things like that. And this was because people give, were given the task to actually do the cultivation, do the, the difference, make things. Yes, yeah, that's true, that's true. And, you know, we don't quite have the history specifically for bonsai for that selection process. Sometimes, yeah. you know, in the horticulture world, there's that selection, but uh, uh, but specific to bonsai, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a short history for, for everyone. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Also, now you were talking about these clothes and, and the bones. One thing that is very particular in Japan, I think, is that the clothes are very green, are, are very lush. And sometimes they might not be reflective of the bones that may be more dependent upon the conditions that it grew, right? So it's like having like a different clothes that do not match the, 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 the person. That's certainly true. Yeah, this this tree is a is not a bad example of that. The clothes are a little more lush than the tree actually suggests. It was growing in a really harsh environment, which would suggest that the clothes are going to be a little bit ratty. <laughs> so there's a contradiction there uh, that you see in you know many of the Japanese shows and European shows and you know the U.S. shows as well. I think uh, is that the clothes in the tree don't quite match. <laughs> That's a really interesting point that you make. <laughs> Sort of like a designer wouldn't be appreciative of it. You know, a clothes designer is like, you know, you're going yeah. to the wrong end, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, but I think but that's not out an alley, not going to a ballroom. You know, there's two very different. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that gives kind of like two different schools, one kind of classical uh, traditional way in which, you know, the, the life is winning way too much, probably, but it's winning. And the other one that is trying to be more natural, trying to be more of reflected upon the nature and the story that the tree is trying to tell. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a <laughs> it's an interesting point. Now, one thing that I I think is uh, is uh, sort of locked into this uh, or adjacent to this conversation is is presentation. Uh, so. This is a very traditional presentation in, a, in an old style pot. Um, and uh, over here is a, is a plant that uh, we got a little more playful with. This is a native plant. This is a vine maple, uh, similar to full moon maple, uh, but it's a Northwest native from Northwestern United States. Um, and this uh, composition has, I don't know if you can make that out, but it's a, it's a arm that's, uh, an internal frame that we put moss around <laughs> supporting this tree up on top that's cascading down. You can hardly, of course, in leaf, you can't see it very well, but there is a trunk in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, I collected this fine maple, but the presentation of it is meant to suggest something that's growing on a rotted log and the ferns over here. These are native ferns that are coming off this log. Um, the form itself was inspired by a gondola that we have here in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> it goes right through the center of the city, but there's this arm that supports these, these lines where the gondola comes down. So anyway, seeing that one day, I thought, oh, that's what I need for this cascading tree. Um, but this is very non-traditional, traditional, non-traditional. Non and I think that, that also 
um, gets into this conversation that that you were uh, you were talking about, where the clothes end up end up being end up changing uh, the presentation of the tree, end up changing what event the tree is going to, <laughs> so to speak. So this kind of locks it into not anywhere, which is what this is, but Pacific Northwest, for instance. I think we can do this with a lot of native trees. You can, you can look for not just unusual presentations. I mean, even the species will give you a hint that it's that you're looking at something new, that you're looking at something that is specific to your area, to where you live, uh, as opposed to somewhere else, a different continent uh, or island. Um, anyway, that's, yeah. that's another thing to think about. Yeah, actually, native, native species is something that we've been promoting the last few years. Uh, first of all, because of growth conditions. I mean, the environment is already more or less used to the environment. Uh, yeah. Also, the diversity. Latin America has a, a huge diversity. And I, I must say that when I first saw that maple that you have there, I could not recognize what it was. I knew it was kind of a maple, but it was not in my list. It's not in my list of, of trees. No. So whenever whenever something new comes, it's like one is trying to figure out what is this? How is it growing? So it actually brings something new. And I think that's, that's important. Also bringing something new brings problems, right? Because we don't have yes. all the, this, this empirical knowledge as to how to work with it. Absolutely. I mean, this one, there's a nylon frame. It was a cutting board for a kitchen that we cut up and we screwed together to form this, this thing. And then it was very hard to use soil with it. So we had to come up with something. So we just wrapped it with sphagnum moss. So the roots of this tree are growing through sphagnum moss, not soil. And so half of this composition, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> it's kind of invented on the spot. Luckily, I was working with about five students. We had an architect, we had a surgeon. Uh, we had a woodworker. We had <laughs> we had a lot of skill <laughs> right there. there um, and, and all I had was a vague idea, so I was very lucky. So, so that's really good for a tea party. Uh, so, so, so here's here is different because this is kind of like the shoes, the shoes for the bones for with the clothes, right? And and the shoes can actually make you run or be different. So I think the shoes. The like, shoots in this case, the container or, or, or wherever the tree is, is put can actually provide like a different, uh, more yeah. artistic part. Yeah, yeah, this here's another different kind of shoe. So this is also a native actually. This is uh, Juriperus uh, horizontalis, which is creeping juniper. It grows up uh, uh, the Northeastern part of North America through Canada as well. Mm -hmm. um, tend not to get much of a trunk on it. Uh, because it's a prostate tree, but uh, this is a pot I made years ago, and um, the tree is a high elevation and high latitude tree, so very cold environment. So the pot, um, I didn't make it for the tree, but when the pot came out of the kiln, I thought, oh, I got the tree for that, because this reminded me of ice that was melting in the, in the rock mm -hmm. uh, on, on, a, on a mountaintop or something. So it's a different kind of, you know, <laughs> different sort of way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, and I think the pots uh, or the containers themselves, whatever they're made out of, uh, can actually influence culture because you can put cultural elements or you can put part of the hints of the story that you want to tell with the tree, right? Because this should be about telling some sort of story, story not, not only just a pretty tree there, but, but something more. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like it. <laughs> Like many many people, uh, if, actually, like from Puerto Rico and other parts, of Republica Dominicana, they saw your forests. This this nice, beautiful forest that you had there in at the U.S. National some years back. Oh, uh, the hemlock. Yeah, uh, the hemlock. The hemlock. This guys, I really love hemlocks. Sadly, I cannot grow them here in tropical weather, but they're really a beautiful species. But but that forest was really you, you had a feeling of very natural type of of environment. Yeah, that was, uh, we have uh, we have very unusual forests here in the, the Northwest. So very, very tall trees that have interesting interrelationships. So it was kind of uh, the direction I was going in for, for a while was looking at um, rather than severe environments on rock tops, which we don't have too much here in the, where I live in the Northwest, we have 
very mild environments, with lots of rain, and so we have lots of moss, and we have these trees like hemlocks that grow in these very sedate, quiet forests, which is not, you know, usually what uh, Japanese bonsai is about. Yeah? Uh, so I, I thought uh, that it would be, be fun to investigate it, and that was that was one of the pieces that uh, that came out of that uh, experimentation. Uh, also minimizing the container, so that wasn't only just on a slab, but it was on a slab that you didn't even see. I mean, it, I tried to kind of hide it with the, the mound. Uh, so since I was a potter, it seems kind of ironic that I eventually went to, in the direction of obliterating the container. <laughs> <laughs> of removing awesome. the work that you like. But, but it, it's a really nice piece. That's a, that's a really beautiful uh, artistic piece. Also, you have a lot of uh, literati type of, of, of trees. What, what type of trees do you like and why? And... Yeah. I like the, the ones that puzzle me. <laughs> Bunjin, yeah, literati is a great example. I think it's a quirky tree because it, it uh, <clears throat> as a style, if we have a skinny trunk tree that uh, usually has to be old to be a good bunjin. So there's a contradiction there. It, it's skinny and old. And usually we think of old as being thick. So uh, usually it has really good bark or something very interesting about the bark. So that is, or maybe a little shari, um, things like that that have kind of a poetic question mark about them make me very curious. Uh, uh, so I like bunjin. You can also acquire it for no money because nobody wants them. <laughs> And they're, they're weird ones, you know, strange plants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 the character and actually doing good bunjin or, or literati, it's it's not trivial because uh, you you play usually with fewer elements. You have less elements and and more more of the trunk length is showy. So you have to be yeah. careful. The direction right. cannot. You have you. Right. It has to go from the base to the top, has to, to be some sort of unison in a way that, that it reflects the same character, right? No, that's a really good point. Uh, you do less hiding with Bunjin because uh, the branches are sparse. So everything has to have interest. I think a really good Bunjin is rare. Uh, it's difficult, uh, yeah. hard to find. Yeah. I think yeah, the, like massive trees. People just they just look for like oh, big trunk and 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 they forget about everything else. Everything else can be just like messy, but they think oh, that's really good because it's very massive. But the actual work is like like shohin, shohin or mame or things like that. The the work has to be more delicate, has to be much more refined. That's a great point. Yeah, it's very uh, it's work heavy. Quality is a result of work. Um, and I think uh, Bunjin, just to use that example again, I think is uh, the selection of material is, is super critical, uh, which is why a good one is so rare. It's sort of like in, in sculpture, you know, a found object. So Picasso with his uh, uh, bullhead, remember the bullhead, is, it, it, he has bike parts. So he has the handlebars, you know, coming up for the horns. And then the head of the thing is the seat of, of, of the bike. Uh, and he put those two things together and you have a bullhead. Uh, so that, those are found objects. And I think for Bun Jin, uh, choosing your object <laughs> is, is often more important than these the thick trunk trees, where so much of it is built later or is hidden, actually. Uh, you can hide a lot of the faults of a, of a thick trunk tree. It, it, it's very hard to do with Bun Jin. Yes, uh, it's, it's very delicate. It's very, uh, kind of a vulnerable form of one side. Um, it's not better or worse. I just find it very intriguing. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so tell me, what are the common mistakes you find people uh, around the, the, your travels that they make when they do bonsai, or what what type of things do you think that they should probably focus more? Okay, you know, just to the, as a general comment, um, I find many people have too few trees or too many. <laughs> There's a sweet spot, um, uh, especially for people in the in the first few years. If they have too few trees, uh, they nibble at their trees and the trees never get a break, you know, because we want to be doing something. <laughs> if they're too many, the, each tree doesn't get enough attention. Uh, and in the first few years, our skill levels are low. So we're working slowly on the trees. So somewhere on the order of 30 trees, 25, 30 trees is about right for many people. More than that, and, and you can get into trouble. If you have a lot of trees on the way to find out, really young plants, you can have a few more than that. If you have highly developed trees, 
that require a lot of maintenance. Uh, 20, 25 trees is maximum for most people who have a job and can only work on them on the weekends. Uh, so that's maybe one of the main things I would say. Um, and then I think uh, very big, I, th I think most of us have a tendency to, to lean into, into art, lean into aesthetics. It's a great urge. But also I think um, because this is a living art form, we minimize what, what should be there at the very start, which is educating ourselves about horticulture goes all the way down to things we tend not to think about, which is like water quality. If you've uh, raised aquarium fish, you know how sensitive they are to, uh, to pH, for instance, and water hardness or softness. Uh, plants are, are a lot more easy, but you and I can drink a glass of water and it doesn't matter what it is, we'll be fine. Um, as long as it isn't polluted. <laughs> but a plant is going to be a lot more sensitive. And if we continue to water it with a pH that's way high or way low, there are very few plants that can survive that. And that might be something that we're forgetting about while we're concentrating on how the plant looks. But the way we get to a plant that looks the way we want it is to take very careful care of things like water things like pest and disease, things about placement in the art. How much sun does the plant want? What kind of species is it? How much water does it want? And then getting familiar with the species well enough that we know uh, when a specimen is in one phase of training and another phase and how that changes what kind of care it needs. Is it a healthy tree or is it a sick tree? How does that influence our repotting schedule? A sick tree might be repotted at half the schedule four years rather than two years, maybe for one that is healthy. Completely different schedule, same species, but completely different. So we can't read lists and say, okay, this is what our, our schedules. It doesn't work for bonsai. We have to be very attuned to the tree. So those are a few things that I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's something also that I that I mentioned that they should look at the individuals. They should know about the the how to take care of the species and, and what things not to do with the species. But at the end also each tree is kind of like like its own person and it's different what you can eat as to what I can eat. Interestingly, from humans, we can actually drink quite a lot of polluted water. Uh, we have genes that do uh, remove a lot of those things. So some other organisms cannot. And we forget that that, that water quality is, is really a very important part. And, and obviously pH for some species. Some species are very tolerant. Junipers can tolerate quite a large range, I must say. But there's other species like Acelias. Acelias uh, means you go to a, a, a basic pH and it will dehydrate, even though it may have all the water there, but it, it's not able to uptake it, right? It won't like life. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cities tend to control water um, a bit more than, you know, if you're on a well, you should be very careful. Um, but uh, do some water testing and uh, that, that'll help a bit. I write a little bit about this in my book, Bonsai Heresy. Uh, I don't have that one translated, that is in English, but, uh, uh, but that's, there, there's a little more information there about, uh, about general care of trees, general horticulture. And I think you wrote one as well, didn't you? Well, yes, I mean, some people might be interested. So actually uh, we can write all the information about it as yeah. well. Yes, I can hear you well. Yeah, for a moment you disconnected, but that's fine. This is oh, so. Good. Okay. Sorry. So we can write. We can write about. Don't worry. We can. We can. We can also put put part of the information as to how to get that book, uh, because even though it may be in, in English, so a lot of people do still read in English as well. So that would be great, and I think the horticulture part, uh, the scientific part as to how to cultivate is really relevant. Because if you have a healthy tree, then you can actually then do some work. If you try to do some artistic work, then like I mentioned people, I don't like to do Ikebana. Uh, uh, you can do very nice design, but it doesn't matter if, if it's a beautiful design for the moment, if the tree is gonna die, then that's, that's not really uh, something that I should be done, right? Not for bonsai sake. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting way to, to see it. Yeah, we're not paying attention to that. Might as well be doing a cabana. Yeah, it's already dead. Yeah, yeah. So, what made you go back to? Because you went to Portland, right? You're in Portland. 
Yes. Yeah, I grew up in New York, so across the country, and I lived in Arizona for uh, some years. I was a potter down there, and from there I went to Japan. When I was in Japan as an apprentice picking up bamboo leaves <laughs> on, the, on the walks in the mornings when we were cleaning, I was dreaming about Portland, which was an area that I had been through a few times. I, I used to travel the country to sell my pots at, at bonsai conventions. And uh, whenever I'd come through Portland, I would, uh, uh, I would think, you know, that seems like a really healthy place. And a good hmm. place back to Interesting, because... Because Portland is now kind of like the Omilla of the U.S., right? With Ryan there and with... with That's right. We have Matt Beal, who studied with uh, my teacher, Shinji Suzuki, for uh, almost eight years. He was there forever. <laughs> uh, he went over as a, a teenager. I think he wasn't quite 18 when he went over. He's highly skilled as well. And uh, we have several of my apprentices in town. We have Bobby Curtright, my first apprentice. Uh, who's got a fun family uh, now on the east side of town. Uh, John Eads, who's um, on the west side of town, and Andrew Robson. All, all three of them stayed here in town, which is marvelous. <clears throat> so, so that's actually quite interesting because now we can actually visit and go like in Saitama, going from one place to the next. Yes, visit, visit Portland. <laughs> visit, visit different dojos. <laughs> Look, so. Don't yeah. say that because we're probably actually going to do that. Uh, uh, well, I, I need to learn some Spanish. I like tango dancing, so I need to learn some Spanish so I can go to Buenos Aires. Ah, I see. <laughs> Here, well, sure. I'm sure you will get some invitation <laughs> after these videos. So, so yeah, Spanish is very easy. I mean, compared to other languages, so it shouldn't be that much of a problem. And technology, technology has improved quite a lot, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, it helps a lot. So, <laughs> I also ho hope you can come back over here because I know, I remember you passing through Merida uh, yeah. at some point and I, people were saying, hey, are you going to visit him? It's like, no. It's like, I didn't know you were there. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> my girlfriend. And yeah, we, we were going through there. It was beautiful. I love the cenotes and oh, it was just great. Well, well, if you guys ever want to come back here, you have your house, so. Uh, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, that was like, wonderful. We can show, we can go more into some of the pyramids and things like that, so it would be, it would be oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. So the time is actually running out, believe it or not. Uh, so it has been doing, we have been doing quite well. What type of species, just one few more questions. What type of species do you like to work with? Oh, um, aside from the natives, I also like the mountain hemlock that you mentioned that you like, and some of these these other wacky ones, <laughs> like the vine maple. You know, like, you have to kind of love what they're good, you know, for uh, some of the natives. Uh, uh, so vine maple doesn't ramify. It, it's something that is this wild child, and you have to love it for that. And so you don't expect it to ramify like a chocolate quince over here, the Japanese flowering quince. Uh, but I also grow that because I love it for other reasons. <laughs> I love things seasonally. I mean, I love the spruce when they're coming out in the spring with their uh, with their green shoots and the, and the pines as well. Um, uh, but uh, but things that flower and fruit have a have a you know a, a seasonal particularity to them. So it depends upon what kind of year that um, <laughs> really focused on something in particular. I do like playing with traditional trees because I love refining my knowledge of how to take care of them using the, the technologies, <laughs> the techniques that the Japanese uh, have designed for particular species, and then trying to apply those to other plants like hemlock and some of our native spruce uh, and vine maple and see which ones work and which ones don't. I think that's a lot of fun. And, and then sharing that, that info. You know? so yeah, that's, the, that's the rocky. Rocky. yeah, that, that's a rocky juniper, right? Yeah, rocky, yeah. We, they have great trunks and Maybe 50% of the foliage is nice. The rest is kind of dangly. And uh, we can learn to work with it, but it's a very busy tree. It's not a, like a shimpaku, which is a very hands-off sort of tree. It's so easy to work with and it refines very easily. It kind of helps you refine it because of how it grows. But a rocky keeps us pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, probably. The, it's like the very runny, very runny type of growth. So getting actually to get like the clouds, the compact clouds is difficult on, on, on a it rock. It is, it is. And if you come to Portland, you go to Ryan's place, you'll see a lot of Rockies and you, there's a lot of foliage differences. There's a lot of genetic difference uh, there. 
Uh, some of them could be left the way that they are. I've right. seen some by Kiko Agawa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and besides that, what places are you planning to travel? Uh, oh, uh, you know, I have never been to South America, so <laughs> I would love to go down there. Uh, All right. Sure. So I have Ecuador in my sights, <laughs> in Peru and Colombia. Uh, so someday I want to go down there. Uh, <laughs> well, in two years, in two years, we have the 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 this meeting, this fell up meeting in Dominican Republic. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the trick is that that because we don't like the way or, or we, I'm thinking as to how to change the way the demonstrations are done. Uh, because usually you, you get a tree and you work on it for two, three hours and then you leave it and forget about it. And, and, and we're trying to evolve from this scenario and do that the people that do the demos, they go one year before or so do choose the tree, work on it, work on it, do the preliminary steps, and then on, on during the convention, do continue the work and, and explain certain type of things because, right. because otherwise you cannot lose track and you um, you cannot, you're, you're starting from zero and, and starting from zero is not the best place to start for, for a demo. Thank you. I'm so glad you're doing that. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's a much more powerful educational tool. I think for decades we've we've done the same thing over and over, which is style the tree. It's exciting. It's fun. Uh, but uh, but then how do you refine the tree? What are the next steps? Uh, those questions never seem to be answered in demo. So your your program is gonna is gonna do well, really really well. Well, let's hope let's hope it works. So we'll, so we'll see if we can get you to the Dominican Republic next year. That would be really nice. Oh, that would be something. <laughs> <laughs> They have some very interesting species, I must say. I was there and I found some species that I had never seen before. So, so that's that's kind of cool, always to find new things. Exciting. Exciting, exciting. Well, it's been really great to have you here, Michael. Uh, Thank you. I do also hope to go to, to Portland at some point. I don't know when. <laughs> I don't know when. Uh, but... Okay, have you give a presentation at the local group here? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah, they would love that. That would be that would be really great. I'd love to do that for business, it's no problem. Um it's just time, you know, it's always finding time to do everything. That's I know. We, we that's, need to uh, ourselves. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, so thank you again, and and, and, it, and it's really good again to see you. Uh, hope to see you some of the meetings are also somewhere else, BCI or or whatever. I know you will be doing some some talk at the WBFF or something like that. I think next week. Yes. In fact, I did a, uh, an online demo, much like what you described. It was several parts, so we repotted the trade a few years, a few months later. We did some refinement on it. Uh, foliage out and so we did something much like what you were talking about is your your reboot of, of a demo <laughs> that's, so that's great that's good but you can see yeah that's great because learning to do some of the refining and looking at the details of what goes next because i think one of the problems for some people is that they get to one stage and they don't really see the light as to how to move over that and they get bored they say they, they think they already reached the top uh, of what they're doing, and they don't see how to evolve from that. And, and because of this lack of knowledge, uh, they get bored and they, they get not so interested into the art, I think. Uh, yeah, well, those demos you're, you're thinking about would be a great gift. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see. Um, hold on.